Now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Jonathan Quick. If you don't know Dr. Quick, he's the president and CEO of Management Sciences for Health and the chair of the Global Health Council. Uh, it's an international non-profit organization with teams right around our world, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. MSH builds local capacity to achieving greater health impacts through stronger health systems. Please welcome Dr. Quick to introduce this year's Jonathan Mann Memorial Lecture. Good evening. <laughs> Distinguished uh, dignitaries, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think we should first pause and say, I think the youth have it this evening uh, with the opening line here and within Johanna. I just want to... <laughs> It's, it's wonderful. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the Global Health Council to introduce the Honorable Michael Kirby, who will give tonight's Jonathan Mann Memorial Lecture. A couple weeks ago, I had a wonderful conversation uh, with Jonathan Mann's daughter, Lydia. And of course, she described the thrill that the kids had when he would come back from conferences like this with act up t-shirts and things like that. But more importantly, uh, was the joy and satisfaction that she described him feeling in working with groups like ACT UP and TASSO and the other AIDS activist groups. That was really a joy in his life. I asked Lydia what her father would say if he was here tonight. She said he would say how happy and proud he was of what this community has achieved by working together in the 15 years since his death. Proud of what's been achieved by working together. But he would also share his disappointment in how much there is left to be done. The Jonathan Mann Memorial Lecture was started in 2000 to honor this outspoken and tireless advocate who put human rights at the forefront of the fight against AIDS. Dr. Mann and his wife died tragically in a 1998 plane crash, also en route to an AIDS conference. It's devastating that the AIDS community has lost yet another outspoken pioneer in New Blanga, and with him five other colleagues from our community. We honor them tonight as we honor Jonathan Mann, who also we lost prematurely. Jonathan Mann fought vigorously for the voiceless, the vulnerable, the stigmatized. By making AIDS, and with it, a human rights issue, Jonathan Mann inspired a generation of activists. But his mission is not finished. The proven power of human rights in the fight against HIV AIDS has become a catalyst for defending human rights across the entire spectrum of the health agenda. Human rights are at the very core of universal health coverage. That's why we at Management Sciences for Health and in scores of other NGOs and other organizations around the world are supporting countries who are pursuing the universal health care vision of health for all. Health for all requires access for all, but it also requires acceptance of all. We cannot stand by and watch discriminatory laws against the LGBT community so audaciously violate human rights as we've seen in many countries, in a number of countries, and a worryingly growing number of countries. Dr. Mann believed that once you take away the rights of some people, you begin to erode the rights of all people. That's why a courageous and passionate human rights champion like the Honorable Michael Kirby was chosen to give this year's Jonathan Mann Memorial Lecture. Michael Kirby is well known to many, probably most in this audience. He was born and educated in Sydney, Australia. He, he uh, discovered he was gay as an adolescent. With that discovery came the recognition that the law was not always kind or always correct. Michael Kirby came to believe that the rule of law, if it means merely enforcing the law, is not enough. The practice of law must always respect human well-being and human dignity. He practiced law 
before becoming a judge in 1975, rose to the various levels of the court system to the High Court of Australia, from which he retired in 2009 as the longest serving judge in uh, Australia. Throughout his career, Michael Kirby has defended victims of unjust regimes and has promoted the cause of international law and human rights, a practice that won him the title uh, of the Great Dissenter because he wasn't afraid to disagree with his colleagues. He's been a strong opponent of oppression and imprisonment of men and women because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. He's also played key roles on UNAIDS, Lancet, UNDP, and other international commissions, including the Commission on HIV and the Law, which Michelle referred to. His work has impacted law and practice in countries around the globe. In short, Michael Kirby has lived the principles that Jonathan Mann stood for, human rights, dignity for all, speaking up and taking action when those principles are violated. On behalf of the Global Health Council, and on behalf of everyone in this hall whose lives are longer or freer because of his work, I'm pleased to introduce the Honorable Michael Kirby. Deputy Prime Minister, Your Excellencies, Premier, Ministers, Michel C. D. Bay, Helen Clark, Mark Dybul, honoured delegates, friends and fellow citizens. We who gather at this conference in Melbourne are not strangers to cruelty and loss. We know about suffering, irrationality, hatred. We have not been free of these forces for a single day since HIV AIDS first appeared in our midst 30 years or more ago. Every one of us can tell stories about horrible acts, brutal conduct that has added to the sum total of misery and danger faced by people living with AIDS and by those who love and care for people with HIV. We have known people who have died or are dying of AIDS, people who are seeking love and human right to respect and to life-saving health care. We know many who are denied basic justice and human empathy. But we are here to affirm that there is another path. We point the way it is why we have come to Melbourne, and it's why we must lift our voices. This is definitely not a time for silence. In the immediate loss on MH17 of friends and colleagues who are coming to join us, we are reminded most cruelly of the earlier death of Jonathan Mann, first director of the Global Programme on AIDS of the World Health Organization, in whose memory this speech is given. This inspired humanitarian, who did so much to alert the world to the dangers of AIDS, perished, as we have heard, with his wife and a plane full of passengers uh, near St. John's, Newfoundland, in 1998. He, too, was on his way to a conference on AIDS. He too had precious gifts still to impart. It was a terrible loss to us and the world, yet his memory drives us on. When I was asked to give this opening pre weeks ago, I little thought that a plane crash that caused those deaths would be multiplied and magnified, this time by the deliberate conduct of human beings that it would kill delegates to our conference and many other peaceful travellers going about their lives with no harm in their hearts towards others. 
how cruel and self-centered those murders appear to be. How reckless and outrageous to make such means of death available to zealots. How much more pain do we have to face in the world of AIDS before we are through this bleak time? Be in no doubt that irrational cruelty is and will remain our companion on this journey. It requires us to remember and cherish the past president of the International Aid Society, Yuk Nanga, and his partner, to think of all the other delegates who expected to be sitting with us here in this hall tonight. They devoted themselves to scientific research, to patient care, to law reform, to activism and human rights. If only we could turn the clock back. If only we could laugh and think and dream and struggle shoulder to shoulder with them here tonight. But we all know that we cannot do those things. And so we think of them and of others who have suffered and are suffering through irrational, unjust, destructive acts. We think in the here and now of Dwayne Jones, murdered in Montego Bay, Jamaica, in July 2013, because he had attended a dance party and was condemned as gay. He was beaten, he was stabbed, he was shot, and then he was run over by a car and dumped in a ditch. His parents would not claim his body. No one brought to justice. We think of David Kato, a gay activist in Uganda. He too was killed in January 2011, hammered to death for opposing the anti-homosexual law that has now been brought into effect in his country. We think of Eric Mbembe, a gay activist in Cameroon, who was murdered in Yaoundé in July 2013. We think of Charles Mondi Racho, who was killed and dumped by the roadside in Western Kenya. The violence does not end, and yet brave reformers continue to stand up for the essential idea of equality. They continue to suffer brutality as a result. Forgive me for speaking of the dead, but their suffering in our context is our demand for action. We think of the mothers. We think of the mothers and families in South Africa who, inspired by global efforts, challenged before the courts the denial to them of antiretrovirals, which for a mere dollar would save their babies from HIV infection. We think of sex workers, drug users, prisoners, transsexuals, and disabled people living with HIV. For them, our conference theme of no one left behind may possibly seem a cruel irony. We think of the bitter disappointments of legislatures that have failed to act and of learned courts that have shown no insight, like the recent decision in India that reversed the noble judgment of the Delhi High Court in the Nas Foundation case in validating the colonial laws against gays. We think of horrible new laws spreading throughout Africa, throughout the Russian Federation and Central Asia, in the Middle East, and the violence that they breed. That violence sets back 
the global struggle against AIDS. We think of lonely patients dying without hope, of women and girls victims of oppression, and the injecting drug users, prisoners, and other outcasts rejected by family and society where therapy and human rights would restore their lives and sense of well-being. We think of all these people and many more and these thoughts also propel us on. Every one of us here in Melbourne and many far away know of those of our companions who were lost on their way to join us. They too knew these things. They too had these images in their minds as they set out on their journey to this continental and welcoming country. They would expect us to pick up our shattered spirits. They would demand that we redouble our efforts they would see those efforts as small but vital pieces of the great human puzzle that seeks to build a world that respects universal human rights and heralds the day when the suffering of HIV and AIDS will be no more. Now I owe many apologies for presuming to speak at this moment of grief and pain. Apologies because the voice should really now belong to those who knew and could tell us the simple stories of our friends that we have lost and of the individual and collective contributions that they have made to the struggle from which we are not released, in which we are still engaged. Apologies, because I am not a person who is living with HIV and AIDS. Jonathan Mann always insisted on the importance of listening on occasions such as this to the voices of those who are infected and attending to what they have to say. Who will ever forget the electric words of my friend Justice Edwin Cameron at the Durban conference in South Africa as he castigated the government of his country and the president of his country for the crazy wrong refusal since reversed to acknowledge the true science of HIV. And I apologize because I'm not a disabled person facing HIV. I now know that it had been hoped and urged that the voice tonight should be given on this occasion to such a speaker so that truly no one would be left behind. I hope that such voices will be raised in these days of winter sunshine in Melbourne, loud and clear. But I can speak as one who has tasted the bitter dregs of discrimination and hatred, in my case because of my sexuality. By reason of that environment, my partner, Jan, in far away, Netherlands and I lost 12 greatly loved friends in the early days of the epidemic. They too suffered discrimination, hostility, indifference and expressions of disgust. But they overcame these emotions. They lived and then they died in the sure conviction that things would get better. And so, through science, through education, through knowledge, through activism, and through human kindness, this has begun to happen. It's happened in Australia. It's happened in other lands. Step by step, it has happened. But the Enlightenment is still to reach many places where all too many get left behind. In 1988, I spoke not at the opening, but at the closing session of the Stockholm AIDS Conference. 
Rereading my remarks on that occasion has taught the essential simplicities of the key messages that must guide us here in Melbourne, especially now. We must rediscover their clarity and their direction. They will restore to us our bearings. By repeating the basic lessons, we may gain success in persuading the sceptical and we may influence change in the directions so brilliantly expounded tonight by Michel Sidibe, our wonderful guru and leader in UNAIDS. And if they will be followed, no one indeed will be left behind. First, there is the vital importance of the message of science. All laws and strategies, as Jonathan Mann taught, dealing with HIV and AIDS must be based on science, not on mythology prejudice. Science has brought us the miracle of triple combination therapy and new lines of treatment. Science has relieved suffering and protected life. Science has made a big difference and nearly 14 million people with HIV are now the beneficiaries of science. Secondly, we must listen to the voices. As Jonathan taught us, people living with HIV and AIDS must always be and remain at the very forefront of our efforts. This will bring us realism, for they will demand action. Thirdly, we must keep and help political leaders to understand the AIDS paradox, also taught by Jonathan Mann. Paradoxically, and almost counterintuitively, the best way to get people to testing and to reduce the toll of death and suffering and to get them on ARVs is not by prosecuting, punishing and isolating those with HIV, it's actually by protecting them, by entering their minds, by getting them to seek help. Law and policy must be made part of the solution and not part of the problem for AIDS. Fourthly, we must acknowledge that the AIDS paradox can be explained to and accepted by politicians on both sides of the political divide. No side in politics has a monopoly of wisdom on compassion. Many have con contributions to make. And we in Australia saw this in those early frantic days 30 years ago. Dr. Neil Blewett, Labor's Federal Health Minister, and his coalition counterpart, Dr. Peter Bone, came together to embrace the AIDS paradox. They reached out in protection of gay men, of sex workers, of injecting drug users and others. In Australia, through the Hawke, Keating, Howard, Rudd, Gillard and Abbott governments, we have maintained this steady course. It is something I believe that Australians can be proud of. It is a strategy with occasional imperfections and failings, it is true. But we can put it before the world confidently as a basic model for effective AIDS policies and strategies that protect everyone. Fifthly, we have resisted many traditional approaches to epidemics inherited from time gone by. From the earliest days, it was clear that quarantine, the law's conventional response, would not, mention, would not uh, respond to HIV and AIDS. There was simply not enough barbed wire in our world for that to happen. The early promises of a medical silver bullet, a cure and a quick vaccine, they continue to elude us. 
Yet the antiretrovirals and then the dramatic outreach promoted by civil society to provide therapy as prevention to 14 million people in the most needy countries has made human rights a reality. So perhaps after all, no one would be left behind. And sixthly, in many countries, leaders have tragically failed to embrace the paradoxes of AIDS. They have talked, oh, they have talked. They have attended conferences. They have received the subventions for antiretroviral drugs. But they have failed dismally to defend the human rights and lives of their most vulnerable citizens. It is well beyond time for the adoption of initiatives by those leaders which have been shown, including in Australia, to work. Without such reforms, and also without changing the global laws on intellectual property, people will suffer and they will die needlessly. It's as simple as that. Someone has to tell those who will not act the practical facts of life on our planet. The real politic. Well, here it is. They cannot expect taxpayers in other countries to shell out indefinitely huge funds for antiretroviral drugs if they refuse to reform their own laws and policies to help their own citizens. Lest there be doubt this is no suggestion that antiretrovirals and support should be withdrawn from those countries but it is a suggestion that this is the real politic of the world in which we all live. Mickey Mouse. In Fantasia. In Disney's Fantasia in 1940, portrayed vividly the global state that we are now in. countries, too many countries are leaving the tap running full pelt. To sweep up the flood with a broom is not going to work. We must turn off the taps and that will not happen without a full embrace of the kinds of laws and policies that we have adopted in Australia and that UNAIDS and WHO and UNDP have constantly urged. Do not think for a moment that it was easy for us in Australia to do what has been done. It was hard, but it has held firm over 20 years. So how have we maintained this model for so long in a country where politics is played hardball? AIDS activists have done so by working closely and respectfully with political leaders of every persuasion, by appealing to human empathy, to human rights, and to the cold realities of economics and the costs of leaving the taps running. Australia's Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, and his government have engaged with AIDS activists. They have worked with us in search for common ground. This dialogue 
surely has lessons for other countries. We can learn from them, but I believe that they can learn from us. Our government has maintained the bipartisan consensus. They've rejected political pressures to halt the highly successful needle exchange scheme. They have endorsed the seventh national HIV strategy only last week, committing to the elimination of transmission in Australia. They have endorsed voluntary testing to get positive people quickly onto therapy. They have cleared the decks for home testing. They have reversed their predecessor's decision and they have committed $200 million to the Global Fund in place of a zero subvention, uh, which they found when they came to office. They have committed, they've committed to help the neighbours in countries of our region, knowing that a virus can enter into our land much more easily than boats. And they have come to this conference, and they have come to this conference in the presence of the Deputy Prime Minister to express solidarity to be with us in our time uh, of grief and concern. As a conviction politician and an unabashed Conservative, Prime Minister Tony Abbott of Australia may actually be able to help us to reach out to those political leaders about whom I was recently speaking. He may do so at the coming G20 summit in Brisbane and at the meetings of members of the Commonwealth of Nations to break the deadly logjam of inaction and wrong policies. Many of those who've left the taps of infection still open are actually more likely to listen to him than to others who talk a language which they abhor. Conservatives, you see, can sometimes be vital allies in the struggle against AIDS. We should never forget that it was President George W. Bush in the United States of America who established the PEPFAR Fund and who promoted the Global Fund that has saved millions of vulnerable lives. By the way, President Bush was also very sound on North Korea's human rights record, but that's another story. And so, once again, we remember Jonathan Mann. We meet together in this struggle. We come to renew our commitment to ourselves, to our lost friends, to strategies that work. Rich and poor are we. Men and women, people living with HIV and those who love and support them, liberals and conservatives, religious and non-religious, able and disabled, straight and gay. We're all in this together. And to those who live with HIV, to those who have died of AIDS and to those who have died in the struggle to advance the principle in the Melbourne Declaration. This conference should give a renewed commitment, a revived energy, a clearer focus to continue down the paradoxical path which has been shown to work. Never to allow the forces of cruelty and ignorance to deflect us. And never to be content whilst anyone is at risk of being left